Hey guys, welcome back to Tidal Gardens. If you've been following along on my tank journey, you'll know that Aptasia have been the bane of my existence for the past few months. Than says they're not that big of a deal when it comes to pests. Like, there's truly so many worse pests out there. Still, I just don't like them. They're unsightly, they get really big, and they encroach on my corals, causing them to retract back, specifically my zoas. Like, they're looking a bit sad. However, if these anemones were a variety of neon colors, I might make an exception, but they're a grayish brown, and they kind of clash with the vibe that we've created in the tank today. I've gone through so many techniques when it comes to Aptasia eradication to the point where I started wondering why I even agreed to do this in the first place. But I think I finally found a solution to the pest issue. So without further ado, let's just dive into the Aptasia battle. When I began my journey as a coral caretaker and I first started seeing Aptasia in my tank, I began using an Aptasia deterrent. It's a reef safe chemical treatment that's supposed to kill off any Aptasia mainly made up of concentrated calcium and magnesium. At first, this was working really well. See an Aptasia, feed it some of this murky white liquid, it goes away. Simple. Little did I know, it wasn't actually that simple. The treatment did a good job of getting the polyps to shrivel up and die back, but it wasn't able to keep them from coming back again. When using this chemical treatment to get rid of Aptasia, you really need to coat the entire polyp as well as the surrounding area to ensure that it doesn't come back. Even if you miss a single molecule of Aptasia, consider your efforts to be in vain because that thing is going to come back whether you like it or not. You'd be surprised how hard even trying to get rid of a small polyp with this stuff could be, especially if it was on the underside of a rock. Not only were most of the Aptasia coming back after treatment, but they spawned some little friends as well, and it just ended up being not worth it to keep using the chemical option because I was just wasting so much product and doing so many water changes to keep up with the influx of chemicals that I was putting into my tank. Maybe this technique works for others, but it definitely didn't work for me. This eventually caused me to kind of give up on the situation. Like, why would I even continue to try at that point? Turns out that ignoring the problem just made everything worse, because that's when it really started to get out of hand. So I really didn't know what I expected when I started to leave things alone. Saying that I thought the Aptasia wouldn't reproduce and create a bigger problem sounds silly, but it's kind of what was going through my head at the time. I mean, it works for people, right? Ignore them and they'll go away. No, Aptasia are the annoying kid that takes that as a challenge and proceeds to get more annoying until you eventually snap. My snap ended up being just covering every polyp I could find in reef putty. Luckily, this ended up working in some cases, but there were some putty spots that either weren't completely sealed or didn't cover the entire polyp because then polyps started to grow out of the putty. The rocks have a lot of internal cavities, and these anemones found a way out. Cue the mental breakdown, followed by every stage of the grief cycle. Over time, I still kept trying to cover the polyps in putty, hoping that by the grace of Poseidon, the Aptasia invasion would cease. But to my dismay, some of the polyps started getting too big for this to work. So instead of wasting the entire Tidal Garden's supply of putty and Aptasia injections on this project that I've definitely let slip through my fingers, I decided that it was probably time to bring in some reinforcements. The first little soldier that I added to my tank in order to tackle this issue is my peppermint shrimp. I decided to put this peppermint shrimp in here because I heard that they sometimes eat Aptasia, and we had an extra one in one of the farming tanks, so I figured I'd give it a go and see how it went. Disregarding the fact that he was very hard to catch and I was kind of afraid of it crawling on me because the way that they swim freaks me out a bit, the addition went swimmingly. I had high hopes for my Aptasia problem when the shrimp ate a pretty decent sized Aptasia in order to keep that space as a home, but that has unfortunately been the extent of his usefulness. <laughs> I knew that going into this that they don't always eat big polyps, and that was the current state of my tank. Big, beefy polyps. So I kind of set myself up for failure with this one. I haven't really seen a decrease in Aptasia since adding the shrimp. I mean, even the one that he did eat eventually came back again. 
Also, to be completely honest, I don't think he really enjoys leaving the comfort of his little cove to go after any of the other smaller polyps. Unless he's eating some really tiny ones that I don't know about, I could have gotten away with not adding the shrimp, to be honest. Love him to bits, but the only thing this shrimp is providing is moltings for me to fish out of the sand bed. In the greenhouse next door, they do a better job of controlling the Aptasia, but here in this tank, there are two reasons why he might not be enough. Sometimes the task takes more of them than just one, so it might have worked out better if I added three to five. Also, I feed this tank a lot to keep everything else happy, and the abundance of other food sources likely keeps him satiated and uninterested in these huge Aptasia. Alright, moving on to the most highly requested Aptasia solution, Bergia Nudibranx. You guys have been going off in the comments telling me to get Bergias, and I get it. They are very good at getting rid of Aptasia. We wouldn't be farming them if they weren't good at their job. Despite these Nudibranx being gold tier Aptasia eaters, the reason I was so hesitant about adding these nudies into my tank is because to my leopard wrasse, these guys are the equivalent of a tomahawk steak at a Michelin three-star restaurant. Really delicious and really expensive. For example, for a tank this size, we would probably want to add three to four Bergias, at least. At $30 a piece, we could easily be throwing away $90 to $120 on a fish meal. I like my wrasse, but not that much. <laughs> We ended up giving it a shot because it was the only option we had left that didn't require ordering new animals. We actually tried to be pretty strategic about it. We stirred up the water in my tank a bit so that the wrasse would immediately dive into the sand bed to hide, and then we would quickly move in like some special forces mission and plant the nudibranchs into the rockwork before the wrasse came back out again. Not gonna lie, the plan seemed promising. However, being that there's been no positive change in Aptasia, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say that they got eaten. And the wrasse didn't even tip well. I'm sure there have been successes in keeping wrasses and Bergia in the same tank. If you have, power to you. But in my case, I don't see these guys becoming friends anytime soon. So I don't know if any of you guys had any luck with Molly Miller blennies in terms of Aptasia control, but we heard a rumor that one kind of Molly Miller eats Aptasia, and thought it would be an easy fish to get and plop into my tank. Problem solved, right? Well, the catch was that yes, there is one kind of Molly Miller that eats Aptasia, but there is also one that doesn't. Problem was, we had no idea which one was the one that did and the one that didn't, and they both look incredibly similar. <laughs> so we went on a whim and got one of the blennies, quarantined it for a month or so, and then finally put it into my tank for a trial run. And to this day, the world will never know if we got the right one or not, because it jumped out of my tank within 24 hours of us putting it in there. <laughs> I swear, I'm not trying to kill everything that comes into my tank. I honestly have no idea how it happened. I have egg crate on top of my tank specifically to keep fish from jumping, and yet this one managed to fling itself out of the tiny gap between the two panels. Just my luck, right? So we tried chemicals, we tried putty and bergias and peppermint shrimp, and a fish for a split second. They all disappointed us and brought shame upon their families. They left us no choice. To avoid being doomed with Aptasia forever, we had to dip into our bag of tricks and pull out Old Reliable. As most reefers know, if you have Aptasia, you get a copper band butterfly fish. However, when it comes to copper bands, the main reason why we didn't immediately put one in my tank has to do with two things, shipping and demand. Copper bands are notoriously really bad shippers. They're just sensitive fish in general, and even if you go through all the proper steps to ship and acclimate these guys, there's really no guarantee that they'll make it. Lots of times they will die on the way here or just become so stressed that they eventually go belly up after a few days from just not eating. If they start eating, that is a great sign, but sometimes they just don't from all the stress of collection and transport. Because of that, we try not to buy them unless we absolutely have to, and that leads me to my second reason, demand. We have lots of tanks here, and all of them need to have some form of Aptasia control. Those tanks take priority over my tank because, well, they make money. Mine is just for YouTube funsies. 
luckily, we finally got to a point where moving a copper band from one of the farming tanks into my tank became a reasonable option. It had already gotten rid of a lot of the Aptasia in that tank and wasn't really needed as much there as it could be used in my tank. So when this first little buddy was first added, there were no signs of outward diseases and wasn't breathing too heavy, all good things. But sometimes a good thing needs to be evened out with something sad. We had to get rid of the orange shoulder tang. To be fair, it was an inevitable decision. This little guy was going to get pretty big once he reached his full adult size, and we figured that putting him into a tank like the Euphilia show tank would be a lot better for him in the long run. He wouldn't have lived up to his true potential in my tank. Also, if you know tangs, doesn't matter the kind, they all tend to have bullying tendencies, so just to be on the safe side, we moved him. The copper band really didn't need any additional stress added to him after being moved. In theory, this should have worked. Keyword there is should have. I mean, this fish was really good at keeping Aptasia at bay in the greenhouse. <laughs> what should be so different about this tank? Well, apparently, a lot of things, because this guy is on strike, refuses to eat anything except the little reef amphipods that he finds, which was very concerning because he started to look a bit thin and we were really worried that he wouldn't pull through. He is still doing okay, no need to panic. After adding mastic, a paste made up of ground shrimp and algae, to the tank feeding regimen, he's been doing just fine. Mastic is actually some pretty interesting stuff. It is one of the only prepared foods I have ever seen a copper band butterfly eat. There are a variety of reasons as to why this copper band stopped eating Aptasia altogether. Number one, stress from moving could have put him off from eating them. Not only can copper bands die from moving stress, but they can just change their eating habits entirely. Number two, the polyps in my tank were pretty big, so he may have been intimidated by them and refused to eat them, However, that doesn't really explain why the small polyps also weren't getting eaten. And number three, this last option may be the most likely reason behind why my copper band stopped eating the Aptasia. I mentioned previously, there's a high presence of amphipods in this tank. If you've been watching my tank from its early days, you'll remember when my tank exploded with these little guys. They were all over the glass, they were bugging my sea cucumber, it was a mess. So that's when I got my leopard rats to kind of keep them in line, which worked great. So now instead of a swarm, I just have a constant flow of smaller amphipods that live in the tank. Now, back to my copper band though, most people assume they are just head over heels with eating Aptasia. I thought they were too, but apparently Aptasia falls maybe second or third on the food hierarchy for these fish. First being small amphipods, since they are the perfect size for the tiny mouths on copper bands. So since the aquariums in the greenhouse don't have sand beds, they have a significantly smaller amphipod population, leaving the only food source for these fish to be Aptasia and maybe some really small shrimp pieces if the other fish don't snag those first. But now that he's in my tank, with lots of these tiny critters running around, he's essentially saying, why would I eat at McDonald's when I could eat at this really nice steakhouse over here for the same price? So, kind of annoying that I had to sub out my orange shoulder tang for a copper band that doesn't eat Aptasia, but say la vie, I guess old reliable isn't as reliable as you'd expect. However, after this, I was just done relying on other beings to get the job done for me, and as I normally do in life, took matters into my own hands. It was time to annihilate these pests once and for all. My last resort was to pull out the big guns. Than came across this device while casually scrolling through YouTube and figured this would be a great thing to try for my tank. It's called Reef Delete from ITC, and it uses UV rays to destroy the DNA of pests that you don't want in your tank. It sounds like a weapon that a villain in a comic book would have, you know, a death ray that destroys your DNA. But hey, I'll be the first to say, maybe those villains were onto something because this thing works. <laughs> you heard me correctly. I finally found a solution that works. Although you do have to be careful because the death ray doesn't discriminate. This can hurt corals as well as fish because it's also made to get rid of flatworms, xenia, cyano, etc. 
but luckily it came with a focus snoot. That's literally what it's called in the instructions. <laughs> and a very short working distance that eliminates any bleed from the UV onto anything that isn't being pointed at. You just have to be mindful of where you're pointing it at. So don't be that guy that looks into the end of it and turns it on because as it is said many times in a Christmas story, you'll shoot your eye out. Luckily, this was anticipated, and this device has built-in safety features that will not allow you to hold down the danger button outside the water. And they also provide you with these incredibly stylish protective glasses that keep your eyes safe. My first experience with this was absolutely insane. When starting out, I took out my rage on the biggest specimens first, because, well, they're big and I hate them. So I had to do what any sane person would do and absolutely destroy their biological makeup. After only four days, they were completely dead. I didn't believe it at first. With the roller coaster of attempts before this, it couldn't have been that easy. But hey, who am I to question a good outcome? I do have some downsides to this device so far. They're small, but still downsides nonetheless. First downside is how long you have to keep that beam centered on its target in order to get the maximum desired effect. The first session of UV for each polyp needs to be at minimum 60 seconds long, and holding down a button with my thumb for that long gets to be a bit much, especially when I want to nuke multiple polyps at a time. So the thumb cramps can get to be a bit much. The other downside is that each polyp needs to be zapped for multiple days in a row, sometimes multiple times per day, in order for it to completely die off. Because of this, it'll take me a bit to get my tank completely aptasia-free, but this is still huge progress compared to before. We still want to see what the long-term effects of this method are. For example, we don't know if aptasias are still able to release spawn as they're dying, leading to more aptasia flare-ups. I don't think they would be able to, since the UV is directly targeting DNA, and I feel like without your DNA, you can't produce offspring. But hey, I'm not a scientist, so who knows. What I do know is I finally get to take out all my pent-up aggression towards these little pests, and I couldn't be more excited. Alright, well, it's been a wild ride. I've tried every solution for Aptasia in the books, and finally found one that gets the job done. I'll be using Reef Delete on the rest of the Aptasia in my tank, and I will let all of you know how it affects my tank long term in the next update. Even if it just kills them back enough for the fish, shrimp, and nudibranchs to catch up, that will be a massive win. Until next time, happy reefing.